Los Angeles police today added more killings to those already linked with the murderer called the Night Stalker. Well, he was convicted September 20th, 1989, and he was convicted on 13 counts of murder, five attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries. Um, was he the worst you've ever dealt with? He was, uh, in terms of uh, as many cases of what he did and how he did it and what he did as a kid, so he was by far the most wild man I've ever met. We are all evil in some form or another, are we not? Gil, welcome. Thanks for joining once again. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. You served three years in the U.S. Army and you had a combat mission in Vietnam. And then after that, you joined the L.A. County Sheriff's Department in 1971 and you served 38 years. So what made you want to go into law enforcement? It was the fact that at age 17, before I went into the Army, a member of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, the deputy sheriff, took me home and told my parents, sign for me to get off the streets or I'd end up dead or in prison. I was not going the right way down the street. And so my parents, they listened and they signed me up. Uh, at age 17, I went in. And when I came out at age 20, I had uh, three goals in life. One was to go to college. And, and I knew I was mature because except for my high school transcripts, and I obviously thought D stood for damn good and F was fabulous. And the only reason they let me into college was because I was a Vietnam veteran. Okay. Uh, number two, I wanted to become a cop. I wanted to become a cop to give back what that cop gave me, and he gave me my life. I owe him everything, and uh, all I ever wanted to do was become a cop and give back, and I've been able to accomplish that in the 38 years I was there. And now that I'm retired, I'm still giving back. I, I'll do anything I can for uh, kids. Yeah. Okay. And um, you obviously featured in the Netflix documentary, Night Stalker, The Hunt for a Serial Killer. The same man is suspected in six to eight murders and 25 to 30 attacks. When did you realize that you guys had, a, um, that yourself and your partner had a serial killer basically on the loose, or that you were dealing with a serial killer? Well, it was really kind of tough because I got the first murder on March 17th of 85. And in fact, on April 10th, I wrote a search warrant uh, where I linked uh, two child abductions and three murders. And it was very difficult at that time to convince anybody, including the judge that signed the warrant, uh, because what I was alleging was unheard of in criminal history. Uh, yeah. Nobody had ever done that. And so it was my theory that it was one man doing it. It took several months before I got uh, the Bureau and other investigators behind me when they realized that it was one man. And was it because, you know, he didn't have a clear modus operandi? He, you know, he... Um... I mean, his, his weapons included guns, uh, tire irons, knives, machetes, uh, what have you. And his victimology also ranged from, you know, I think between the ages of six to the mid 80s. Six to 85. And that was it. Uh, if you look at criminal profiling, the way they do it, they base everything on criminal history. Yeah. And nobody in criminal history up to this time had been documenting uh, doing the things that I was alleging. And nobody since then has done it, has repeated it, because a lot of the stuff that he did, we didn't go public with it. And yeah. it's exactly right. His only consistency was his inconsistency, which made it extremely difficult. He followed no patterns. One instance, he actually removed the eyes of, of a victim, I think it was Maxine Zazera. And... Um, yeah. Other victims, he you know cut their throats, and he was pretty much all over the show. And he also used to take... I believe, snack breaks afterwards where he would raid the victim's fridge? Well, sometimes he did, sometimes he did. A couple of times he ate food. Uh, he didn't do that at every residence. And um, you guys came pretty close to catching him a couple of times. Can you tell us about that? There was one time where an LAPD officer stopped him. Officer Starbos 
uh, stopped him after an attempt child abduction. And at that point in time, uh, he got Richard out of the car, had him have his palms down on the hood of his car as he patted him down for weapons. And this guy was a motor officer. And so he was intent on giving Richard a ticket for running a red light and for driving without a driver's license. So he went back to his motorcycle. And when he did that, Richard, in fact, uh, drew a pentagram on the hood of a car, on the hood of the car he was leaning on. It was a stolen car. And he took off running. And the cop never got him, so he got away. And we didn't know at that time that it was Richard. Uh, we knew it was Richard after, but that cop didn't know it was Richard, didn't know what was going on at that time. And then the Wednesday before he was captured, he's actually on a motorcycle and he was stopped again by members of the Los Angeles Police Department. And they were writing a ticket. Matter of fact, Richard told me later that uh, we ought to advise those cops because there were two cops and one was writing the ticket. The other one was talking to people as they came walking by. And what they didn't know was Richard had a gun in his crotch. And he says, I could have dumped them if I wanted to. And they did. And they let me go and gave me a ticket. And I drove off. And there was the um, the the Dennis office, the, the incident there where a panic button didn't go off. Well, we didn't come close to capturing that. That was a, uh, there was an executive from my department that thought that we were wasting time uh, because there was a dental office in the jurisdiction of the Los Angeles Police Department right there, what we call Chinatown. Okay. And he had gone into uh, the dentist there. We found a dental appointment card in the car that he got away with uh, from the LAPD motor officer. They took in as evidence a little plastic holder and it had a dental appointment card with the name of Richard Mena. And okay. so we went down and we contacted the dentist and the dentist gave us a description of the guy. And I had a very close personal friend that was a dentist. And so I got that doctor to give me his uh, some x-rays. And we decided that, that because my dental friend said, this guy's going to have to come back. He's got an impacted tooth. It's really bad. Mm. So he's going to be back. Not going to be able to take the pain. So we then stuck two officers, two deputies inside the dental office, two Asian officers undercover, and they sat there. And that dentist was working seven days a week, 12 hours a day. And he didn't speak much English. He was very, very broken English. So our guys were just making, they're happy. They're making money. Mm. And then one of the executives from our department said, you know what, that's a waste of time. He's not coming back. He made the decision. Yeah. And we said, it's a waste of time and it's a waste of, we're wasting money. Pull him out and have the jurisdicting agency, that's LAPD, yeah. have them put a silent alarm in there. They have robbery alarms and it'll ring directly to downtown and they'll get somebody over there right away. So they did. Unfortunately for us, there was a malfunctioning alarm that was installed. It didn't work right. So later that night, the day it was installed, later that night, I get a phone call and the dentist is beside himself. Why don't you come? You know, why didn't we go down there? <laughs> and he told us he kept hitting the alarm. And so we then got permission the next day because he had been there. Yeah. We went, got some work done. And so the next day, put our guys back in there, but he never came back again. And at what stage did, uh, did you first realize that, you know, Ramirez was into satanic worship? A lot was made that you're a devil worshiper. You have listed you, just yes or no? Have you studied yes, Satanism? Yes, I have. Uh, we didn't really realize that until towards the end of the investigation. Okay. Uh, he left the pentagram on the wall up in San Francisco. Yeah. He left the pentagram on a leg in Monrovia, which wasn't until June uh, sometime. And then when he went to uh, Mission Viejo, we told the young lady up there, uh, 
Farns, I believe is her last name. And uh, he told her, don't swear to God, swear to Satan. He, he also told our uh, diamond bar victim, Kid Abawa, not to swear to God, to swear to Satan. And um, you had a particular suspect that, um, obviously by watching the documentary, that actually looked pretty good. He, uh, he's a, he had some dodgy habits as well. And um, yeah. yeah, how certain were you? Well, was there ever, ever, you know, at any stage, a point where you guys thought this has to be the guy? I thought he had to be the guy. Uh, and at this time, bearing in mind early on the investigation, a lot of people were not believing in my one man theory. Of, yeah. uh, one guy, one individual that was, was the guy that broke me in a homicide, my original training officer. Okay. And he and he said he trusted me, he knew me, and he knew I was on to something. But he told me, he says, You you're following a freak, but yeah. he's not your freak. This is not your guy. And uh, he was he was right. Yeah, because this guy had uh, I mean he had he had some uh you know dodgy pictures and stuff. Um in his house, because you guys, well, I, I think you got a search warrant for his house, I believe. We got a search warrant for his house. We we put a, a surveillance on him for a few days. Yeah. And he was doing some very, very sketchy stuff. Mm. Uh, the way he was darting in and out and following women and going into bars. And some lady bailed out of his car one time. He picked her up, drove just a few feet, and then she jumped out of the car to get out, get away from him. And he was... He was a strange guy. So we did a search warrant on his house. And in his house, we found a, a whole treasure trove of pictures. And these were uh, back in the 80s, you know, people would cut out, you know, they didn't have all the wild magazines that they do available. Yeah. They didn't have computers back then with all the adult material. So this guy had, if uh, you were in a Sears magazine or Macy's magazine, and you were modeling ladies' underwear. He had it cut out. Okay. There were all kinds of cutouts of ladies in in undergarments, and their and he had ladies' underwear in the, in his box. And all the ladies' underwear were cut in the crotch or stabbed in the crotch crotch area. So this guy was like my partner said, my train officer. He's a freak, but he wasn't my freak. Wasn't yours. And what kind of exonerated him? Uh, well, the fact that we knew we made, he wasn't involved in it. We could prove okay. that he was not involved in it at all. So therefore, we're done with him. You know, let, it's another crime. Somebody else, I'm working murders, and we didn't have time. At one point in time, and we had our search warrant sealed at this time uh, because everything was very secretive. We had very confidential. Yeah. And so we actually got contacted by a local elementary school by where he lived. And wanted to know, uh, they had heard about the guy that we had been following and he lived by there. And, we, and they wanted to know if uh, we could give them the information we had. And we told them we couldn't. So yeah. it's not, not our problem anymore, unfortunately. Which we had to weigh the, the what we're going to gain out of releasing the information or what we're going to lose. And we okay. have a lot more to lose. And um, this obviously took place before the incident at the Dennis office and um, the, uh, yeah, basically yes. just timeline was. Okay. Yes. And except for the, because the major clues that you had was the uh, Via <laughs> shoe print, um, yes. which was, this, this was found at a victim's house. Yes. This was found at the, the first footprint showed up at the Zazara residence. Okay. The Maxine Zazara was. Yeah. And it was a very unique shoe print. It was a brand new shoe print. Uh, they were brand new on the market. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I can tell you, you know, we did studies, make sure it's on January 9th, 1985, 1,356 pair of Model 440 of has arrived in New York from Taiwan for distribution uh, throughout the United States. Six pair ended up in the state of California, one pair ended up in Los Angeles. So that was a very, very unique shoe print to us. Yeah. And um, did you guys know what caliber gun he was using? He was using a 22 caliber, but he, at one time he switched calibers. He used 25 as well. Okay. 
And now with these clues, um, these clues were then famously made public by the mayor of San Francisco at that time, Diane Weinstein. She uh, wasn't a fine lady. Yeah, you've, uh, <laughs> yeah, how you guys obviously weren't, uh, you know, big fans of her at that stage, but uh, you know, it's still, it's still just baffling to, to kind of think about what was, what could she have been thinking by doing that, by releasing that to the public, you know, Ramirez then apparently just dumped the shoes off the Golden Gate Bridge and, yes, um, you know, he got wind of this and you guys were basically had to start all over again. We were, uh, I was beside myself. We just flown back in from San Francisco. Yeah. When we were coming into our building and our media section saw us coming in and said, hey, fellas, come here. I want to take a look at this. It was Feinstein holding her press conference. And last week, San Francisco Mayor Diane yes, Feinstein we're announced we're ballistic tests it. have yeah. definitely linked the murder of a man there to the Night Stalker. There was not one word that I'd be willing to say inside a church came out of my mouth shortly thereafter. And I, I can only, she was a politician, she's grandstanding, she has information that nobody else has, she's releasing and made her feel powerful. I have no idea. You know, I, I'm only a, I'm, I was only a cop. I wasn't a psychologist. I don't know what makes her, what makes her, what drives her, why they do the things they do. She, well, she's recently been hospitalized with shingles, I believe. Yes. But and she's, in, she's announced her, she's announced her retirement from the Senate, probably about 40 years too late. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is the general opinion. And consensus about it um was your with all this going on how was how did it affect your family life um oh. and did you ever worry that ramirez <laughs> was there a worry that ramirez could target you or your family you know in the beginning uh, no it didn't in the beginning uh, when i was putting in so many so many hours and my captain at that time is quoted in the los angeles time which is a major paper here yeah uh saying that we're working seven days a week, 16, 18 hours a day. So it was easy for me to justify telling my wife, you're in charge of the house and the kids. Yeah. I'm in charge of trying to capture this killer. And so my mind was totally focused on uh, everything I could for, to capture the killer. Uh, I never took into effect that the fear factor you know, how fearful my wife was going to be. And yeah. at one point in time, my wife, I called my wife to check on the family. <clears throat> and she told me that she was down uh, my parents' house. She had caught my 13-year-old daughter crying in the bedroom when she asked her why. She said, I just want this to be over. I want my daddy back home. Yeah. And when I she told me that, I just big lump in my throat, tears started coming down. Mm. And I said, I got to go. And I hung up. And as soon as I hung up, I started uttering profanities once again. Uh, I was mad at my wife. Why are you telling me this? I don't need extra stress yeah. on me right now. I don't care if the house washes away. But yet she did. And I, I was never afraid because I carried a gun. I was a cop. I had partners i had cops around me so i wasn't concerned about myself and i was my wife was staying in areas where richard had not up to that point uh not that we were aware of it hit he had certainly hadn't killed anybody and people seemed to be a little safer in numbers so i, I wasn't that concerned when he went down to uh Mission Viejo, which was the Sunday before his arrest. When I came home, I had footprints around my house. Footprints should not have been. Nobody would be walking. They were muddy. Uh, it, was, it was not right. Okay. Now, my, my family, by this time, was gone. Yeah. They were no longer living in my house. But because I had the footprints, we couldn't justify them. Uh, we had a surveillance team sit on my house, you know, to make sure that I, for, for my safety. And Richard later on will tell jail deputies that uh, he knew where I lived. He had been by my house. But they weren't the Avia footprints. 
he had already dumped the shoe. They were, they were, uh, it looked like could have been possibly the other, what, the Stadius, oh. Oh, which wow. he was yeah. ultimately arrested in. Well, the case was so well publicized, so he obviously knew who the head detectives were. Yes. Yes, yeah. he did. And, the um, first time we walked in on him, he knew exactly. He said Carrillo Solero. He knew exactly who. He was, he was um, apparently in awe of, uh, of, of Frank Salerno because, of the, um, because he caught the Hillside Strangler. Yes, he had worked on a Hillside Strangler, and Richard was well-versed. He was well-read, mm. uh, self-taught, but well-read. And in his words, uh, he says, uh, uh, let's see, he says, he says, Gil, I got an eagle that will fill this room. I can tell you everything about the serial killers from the time. The Romans fed the Christians to the lions, the modern day serial killers. So he was, he was, he was, he was a student of, of serial killers. Yes. I asked him at one time, he said, because Rich, well, I called him Rich. Yeah. And he called me Gil and he called Frank, Mr. Salerno. So at one point I looked, I laughed. I said, Hey, why do you call him Mr. Salerno? And he called me Gil. He says, because that's Mr. Salerno, Gil. He worked on the Hillside Strangler. I said, what do you think? He was seven foot tall and over? He says, no, but he's done that. You know, so he was he was awestruck with him. And he was really awestruck when we put him in a cell and we told him that that was the same cell that uh, Angelo Bono was in. So to him, it was, it, yeah, it was like almost being in a in a celebrity's exactly. cell, so to speak. Yeah. Um. I mean, they, I mean, there's so many stories of him, you know, when he was in prison. Um, I think Different Strokes actor, is it, I think it's Todd Bridges. Um, Todd Bridges. He told a story so that Ramirez... Sean Penn. Yeah, Sean Penn was in prison with him as well. Um, yeah. But I remember Todd Bridges told a story of Ramirez used to shake his cell and basically say that he was going to get him. Um, and apparently, the, the reports that Ramirez tried to escape from prison a few times. I'm not aware of any escape attempts. I I read that somewhere. But now the thing is why I'm kind of bringing this up to you is because there's obviously been a a lot written about him and, you know, some of, some of things must've been added on, you know, to increase the so-called, you know, mystique of of the case. But um, you've never been phased by his, you know, the, the way he's portrayed to him. Or to you, he's just another, he's just a bad guy that you guys have to put away. He's nothing more than another human. Yeah. That's all he is. And is that kind of a mentality that is shared by most detectives? I can only, you know, I, I, I can only speak for myself. Okay. And I know, I know my partner, Frank, and there was, Frank wasn't concerned about him at all. Yeah. Uh, I would think, I would like to think the most are level-headed and, you know, we just think, hey, he's, he's human. Uh, somebody who is, let us say, very deeply religious. Well, as a matter of fact, during the investigation, I had a very close friend of mine give me a prayer card. He said, here, keep this with you and keep it in your wallet. You're dealing with the devil. You know, and so someone like that that was extremely religious, extremely to one side, this may have affected him because due to his belief. But yeah. when you get it down to its simplest form, uh, Satanism is nothing more than another form of religion. And religion is having faith, and faith is believing in something that logic says isn't so. Yeah. So there's no difference in his religion. I just don't believe like him. You know, that was it. And, and there was a, at one point in time, I really got angry. And, and I want to clarify something. That Escape, the, uh, escape attempt that never occurred. I'd have while he was in custody here, I would have known about it immediately. Yeah, like, yeah. We monitored everything, and I know it didn't happen up in San Quentin because I got word there was a young deputy, a female deputy sheriff, that uh, inserted a Bible into uh, Richard's cell, and there were there were explicit instructions his door was not to be open with less than two deputies and a sergeant okay. present. He was a high-profile guy, wanted nothing to happen, and she opened the door and got a uh, Bible into him. And I heard about this, and I went through the roof. 
I didn't care that it was a Bible. Uh, I went through the roof. I wanted her fired. I wanted her demoted. I wanted her getting out of it because I said, she said, God told me to give you this. And I said, what happens if God tells her to kill him? Hmm. What happens if God gives her other instructions? Yeah. We got to separate religion and work here at this facility, ladies and gentlemen. So I was quite upset. So I'd hear about everything. Hmm. Okay. And, um, you know, what was he like in court? He seemed like he was almost a bit of a, you know, he was a bit of a showman. Um, he, you know, he pleaded not guilty and he had a pentagram drawn on his hand where he, I think he still said, hail Satan. Early on, he had displayed a satanic symbol and proclaimed hail Satan. Hail Satan. He's a prima donna. He's an egotistical guy, uh, but he played up to the cameras and he knew what he was yeah. doing. He wanted it. He had an image that he wanted to fold. The, the courts appointed a psychiatrist to go in and evaluate him. And Richard threw him out after 30 minutes, a little, little less than 30 minutes, threw him out, didn't want to talk to him because he didn't want people to think that he was crazy. Okay. He knew what he was doing. So yeah. he, he, this didn't phase him, you know, uh, his final words publicly here in LA County was when they were taken out of the court into the bus for transportation back to the jail facility. And he said, uh, see you at Disneyland. Somebody yeah. said this would be easy. <laughs> see you. Big deal. That's always went with the territory. I'll see you in Disneyland. He he asked us because uh, we sat with him about four or five days uh, in a row after his conviction. After it's all over with, he's been sentenced to death, and now we're getting ready for transportation up to San Quentin. And we talked to him. Matter of fact, there was a made-for-television movie out at the time. And we actually watched the movie with him. And uh, he didn't get to watch it himself when he was alone because he was uh, some kind of disciplinary violation. And okay. so we just went down there. And at that time, we're sure it's homicide. It's pretty much we get what we want as long as it's within reason. We wanted to watch the movie with him. Yeah. So we did. And we talked to him. We got talked about a lot of stuff in those four or five days. And everything was between him and I and, and Frank. And so the only request he had, first off, he wanted to know if we were going to go up and be witnesses to his execution. Mm -hmm. And my partner, Salerno, said, you damn right, I'll be there. And he asked me, and I just said, I'll know, Rich. You want me there or go? You don't. I've seen enough that, you know, I've seen it in Vietnam, I've yeah. seen it in the streets here, I don't care if I can go along. And he says, well, I'd like you there. I said, okay, I'll be there then. He's kind of established his, uh, it wasn't a friendship, it was just, we were able to get along with each other. And uh, so he said, yeah. he wanted to, he wanted to fly to, uh, he didn't want to go on the bus to San Quentin, he wanted to fly. Okay. And I said, okay, we'll arrange for a flight. We'll go up there. We'll fly you up there. So after we left, I told my partner, you know, we've got this six passenger plane and the department will fly us up there with no problem. And, but I don't want to go. And he said, why not? And I said, because if Richard acts up on the plane, we're going to have to shoot him. Yeah. So there's no place to move around. We're going to have to kill him. Yeah. And if he dies on that plane, the public's going to go nuts. We'll wire Gill and Frank taking him back there. Yeah. And so we just put him on a regular plane. We, we put him on our sheriff's plane and they took him up there with regular guys from our transportation bureau. And when they did, they said, Gil, we wish you'd have been there with us. Some guy, they had two uh, guys from San Quentin had to be at least six foot five. They could have taken off their shirts and pinned their bands on their chest. They looked like they were tight ends for a professional football team. And when Richard walked in, they just told him there was no short terms that this wasn't Disneyland. He was nothing more than a number up here. He wasn't. He was nothing. Yeah. He'd get his clothes off, get naked, and get naked now. And they said Richard's eyes were ready to bug out then. He was scared. And I said, well, that would have been all worth it to see. But he, 
made it. All right. The movie that you were referring to, was that the one, uh, was that Manhunt Search for the Night Stalker, the 1989 movie? Yes. yes. That's the, f- yeah, you were, you were played by actor Adolfo Martinez, if I'm not hey, mistaken. Martinez. Yes. yes. And that's the first movie. That is how I um, be- became aware of Richard Ramirez the first time. I was, I think I was about seven or eight <laughs> when I watched it the first time. And um, yeah, that is... That is how I heard about him was through that movie. Um, what was his, he had shockingly enough, he had a massive fan base, uh, like a woman, you know, women used to, you know, love him and whatever. What was that like? Did they show up in court? Yes. Yes. Some of them did. Some very attractive ladies. And made me want to become a criminal, you know, get a following like that. He did. Uh, he had he had a very large following that he's got uh, still to this day an extremely large following. Not so much of women now. Now it's about everybody, and I'm getting told on social media <laughs> there's somebody out there that has started a, a movement saying that uh, we framed Richard. Uh, in this I've case. had yeah, <clears throat> I've had comments. Um, it's probably this. It, it could be the same person. I've had comments on because I've done a few videos. I did. I did the one video right in the beginning. You were my first episode on the podcast, and um, I had comments on that video, and I had, I did a solo video on Richard Ramirez as well, and I had comments on that also saying that he was framed, he was innocent. Um, it's it's strange. Um, yeah, they they yeah. said framed. He's innocent. We lied. It yeah. was the kangaroo court they've done everything now and all i do they i've had people tell me that they wish i were dead richard should be alive and i should be dead for what i did and i was asked i was doing a podcast for two years we just finished uh, a couple of months ago about a month and a half ago with mr george lopez the actor yes. comedian and he asked me on his podcast uh what did you do what do you think when you get that stuff and i said i laugh there's nothing i could do uh, I'm 73 years old. I've had a full, complete life. I had a job. I have an income. And I'm happy with my family and friends yeah. and the way everything is gone. And I know that he was scrutinized. There was absolutely nothing illegal, unlawful, or any lies that went on yeah. in that trial. And some poor individual is uh, sitting back behind a computer and starts talking stuff because he can be brave, but they can be brave. And there's no doubt in my mind, he doesn't have a job, doesn't have an income, doesn't have much of a life. I don't know how many friends he's got, but God bless him. He probably voted for Feinstein. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, um, well, th- th- there's basically, it's, uh, it's, um, it's, it's actually a psychological, there's a condition called hybristophilia, which is a condition where you are, people get infatuated with um, notorious criminals. And they they fantasize about them and whatever. So obviously this individual kind of surely falls into that category. And um, but you know, Dude, back to his female back to his female fan base. Um he actually got married in prison to uh Doreen Leoy. And there was a strange interview that I watched with her where she you know the reporter basically asked her, or the interviewer basically asked her, well, you know, this guy's the to many the personification of evil. And she's just like, well, you know, she doesn't see him that way. No one knows him like she does. I mean, it's just. I can't help the way the world looks at him. They don't know him the way I do. And she deserved him. And I understand. I I don't know because when he did get married to her, uh, up until that time, I was told that Richard was going to uh, wanted to talk to me again because he was good for four more murders down here in L.A. County that he would top two and but he needed uh, to be about seven years be in custody before he'd be ready to talk about him openly and i said okay we'll, 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 we'll wait well just before that interview came about because i was contacted by mr phil carlo who wrote the wrote a book on the night stalker okay and carlo tells me he says hey gil rich says he's ready to talk to you you're ready to go up there and i said, okay, we'll tell Rich if he's ready ready to tell me the truth and not bullshit me. 
like you did the deputies down here, I'll go up there because in my mind, yeah, a trip for me to San Quentin is like a trip to Disneyland for him. He doesn't get this attention. Yeah. <laughs> now he's going to get me up there and get the attention. Well, before that trip happened, he got married. And I got contacted by the media, and I said it was a mockery of the criminal justice system because he was put in there for punishment, not for rehabilitation. Yeah. And he was sentenced to death. Number two, it was a mockery of the sacrament of marriage. He was never going to consummate his, cons, consummate his marriage. So why does he have the right to go ahead and get married? It, it belittled so many others. And so he obviously got to see what I said. It was on national news. So then it was he no longer wanted to talk to me. <laughs> well, he had a, you know, his, he had a, he had a rough childhood as well. Now the, yeah. the subject always comes up of nature versus nurture. You know, the reports, his dad was abusive. Um, his cousin who he looked up to Mike, I think he also served in Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken, but um, he yes, shot he his wife in front of Richard. I think when he was like, well, he was young, he was like 12 or 13 or whatever. And um, he used to sleep in the graveyard to, you know, find peace he used to sleep in the cemetery to get away from home and i also read that his mother was a devout catholic and that she used to take against one of these stories i'm not sure whether it's true or not but apparently she used to take him to, to watch executions at the local prison which doesn't sound that i'm no i i'm not, not aware of that i i don't think i'd ever heard about that because we did we did look into the family background and, uh, yeah and mother was, they, they were Catholics, they were devout. Uh, as a matter of fact, as it turns out, Richard was, uh, after the documentary came out in, in 2021, yeah. I was contacted by someone who turns out to be the niece of Richard Ramirez. Yeah. And Richard had been molesting her from age uh, six until she was 12. And we found out about it, and she's doing wonderful, you know. And when she told the family, finally opened up to the family at age 18, uh, they condemned her, including Richard was her father's brother. I mean, the whole family condemned her. Nobody believed her. How could she talk bad about Richie? When I finally started to say something about what had happened to me, they did not believe me. And this went on, and the mother, like I said, everybody condemned her. And they did not accept the, the mother nor Richard's sister actually forgave her for coming out and saying what she did about Richard. But the dad finally broke down and said he was sorry. He didn't realize that his brother really was. Now he understood that he really was violating his own daughter. Wow. He's like, and um, did you ever meet his dad? Well, I met him in court. I didn't okay. go up and shake his hand or anything. <laughs> was. He came up and, uh, his dad came out and testified. His dad, uh, his dad was a good piece of work for, for us. He yeah. testified that Richard had been back there. And then I found uh, the writer that wrote an article in the paper the day after Richard's arrest down in El Paso. And I tracked him down to Florida. And I asked him if he remembered writing the article. He said, yes. And I said, well, you ready for a vacation in L.A.? And so we flew him up to L.A. and gave him a few days here. He testified and then went back. And so he... Everything the father had said, he just blew him right out of the water. And, um, Gil, you have a, a, a soft spot for kids. Um, yes, Anastasia Ronas, what was it like speaking yes. to her again when the documentary was made? And did you have any contact with her uh, prior to that? No, I had had, uh, in 2009, when I retired, local television station out here did a four and a half minute piece on my retirement and which is totally unheard of down here i was only a lieutenant i wasn't chief of police or anything at the time and 
they retired. Uh, they came out and did an interview. And shortly after that interview, uh, I was on my way to meet my wife. We were camping locally. And I got called by the office that some lady wanted to talk to me. And so they I called the lady up and it happened to be her mother, Anastasia's mother. And she wanted to thank me for the way I treated her daughter like it was her own child. And over the years since it had happened, every time I'd come out on TV, I did stand-ups for our murders. Uh, they'd run to the television. It's like, hey, here's Uncle Gil on television. And uh, before you know it, I'm I'm just crying. I yeah. told her I'd never wanted to check up on any of the kids because I didn't want to hear that they were psychologically harmed. Yeah. yeah. And I was just so grateful that Anastasia was doing well. And so I still never talked to Anastasia. Mm. When they started doing the documentary, first thing I told them was, I will be your speaking head, but I'm not going to help you find any victims, any witnesses yeah. or anything. And I can't do that. And they said, okay, next thing I know, they're calling me up. They said, she would like to talk to you. And they gave me her number. I called her up and we talked and we both cried. I know I was crying. Yeah. And she said, you know, over the years, I've wanted to call you so much, so many times. But what was I going to talk to you about? I was six years old then, and now I'm 42. What do we talk about? Mm. And I just always wanted to talk. So I talked to her, and I told her, that, please don't do this documentary because for me. Yeah. You know, she had to, they wanted her to be a part of the documentary. I said, don't do it for me. If you think it's right to do, you do it. If not. And so they then called me up uh, from the documentary and they said, she's going to do it, but she wants you on set. And so I went down there and the very first time we saw each other, it was a big embrace, big hug. And I cried again. And she's a special lady. She'll always be a special yeah. lady. Uh, now she's married, children, her and her husband are both doing great. Her only fault her only fault is uh, she's a San Diego Padres fan and I'm a Dodger fan. But aside <laughs> from that, everything's great. <laughs> I mean, it's such, it's, it's so amazing to hear that she's doing well after, you know, I mean, after what she was, you know, what she went through. Um, I mean, no child or well, no one should go through, through any of that. And, you know, luckily they, she didn't have to testify as I understand it or none of the, the kids no we dismissed the we dismissed the kitty cases yeah we originally filed on them and then we dismissed them and it was because of anastasia that we dismissed them we went down her house uh getting ready for a preliminary hearing mm. and, and my partner the wda phil Halpin, and myself went down our house to re-interview her to make sure see how things were going and when they brought her out uh she had Mommy had her by the hand. She jumped up on Mommy's lap and she's, do you remember these men? And she nodded yes. Then she whispered something in Mommy's ear and an embarrassment put her head down and was giggling. And she, Mommy said, she wants you. And she was pointing to me. She wants you to know she remembers you the best. You remind her of her teddy bear. <laughs> and so uh, we started talking and the DA said, I want to talk to you about that day that we were down in that big building in the theater. And uh, she says, oh, yes, I remember that day. And I remember piggy number two, which immediately was a concern. Why does she remember number two so quickly? Is somebody coaching her? Where yeah. did she get this information from? And we didn't even tell her that she was right, but she picked number two. Number two, step to the red square in the center of the line. Number two, in a loud, clear voice, repeat this statement. Shut up, bitch. Shut up, bitch. He said, why do you say number two? She says, because I knew it was him as soon as he walked out. But I knew how important this was and how absolutely positive I had to be. That's why I got up and I went and took a second look up on stage, a close-up look at him. And I'll go to court and testify. Mm -hmm. if it means keeping him locked up so he can't hurt any of the little kids. Wow. Like he hurt me. Yeah. And I got up and I walked out. I, I Tears came down my cheeks <laughs> About 30 seconds behind me was my partner, Salerno, and right behind him was helping and helping. Just says, hey, fellas, 
what do you say we dismiss all the kitty cases? Mm -hmm. No need to put the families through this or the kids. And we all agreed. So they were gone. Well, he was convicted September 20th, 1989, and he was convicted on 13 counts of murder, five attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries. Um, was he the worst you've ever dealt with? He was, uh, in terms of uh, as many cases and what he did and how he did it and what he did as a kid, so it would be by far the most vile man I've ever met. And yeah, because I mean, his his spree basically went. It, it lasted one year. I mean, there's a lot of damage in one in one year. It started in nineteen. It actually started in nineteen eighty four. Yeah, he was arrested August thirty first of eighty six. Wow. And um, well, Gil, just on a lighter note, I believe I think I might have it right, or I could have it wrong. Did you and your wife recently had your celebrated your fiftieth wedding anniversary? If I'm not mistaken. We celebrated our 52nd. 52nd. Okay, I'm two years off. My third goal when I got out of the Army, since you brought it up, my third goal was to start dating my ex-girlfriend that wrote me a Dear John letter when I was in Vietnam. This is a great story. And yeah. I came out of June 1970. By September of 70, I had her eaten out of the palm of my hand. And all I wanted to do was break it off with her. And so... We ended up getting married December 26 of 1970. So two out of three. Two out of three. And I keep reminding her I'm working on number three. <laughs> You're just taking your time. Um, That's right. Gil, what wasn't in the documentary that, is, that was pretty interesting oh, or that you would have liked to have been in the documentary? I, I, I don't know. The documentary was... It was far beyond my wildest expectations. It was pretty good. Uh, there was one there was one part in there, uh, Frank, from the very beginning, said if we ever do anything, they've got to put this, they make a movie out of it, they got to put this in there. There was one where we had a private arena. It's uh, where they hold Mexican rodeo, or they call them chateados or uh, at this arena. So it's out of the view of the public. There's fences all around. And we brought in a beer truck. We brought in all kinds of food. And there were probably about 200 cops in there that were just, it was a dinner celebration and drinks saying thank you to all the, everybody that worked on the night soccer case. And there are a lot of horses around. The so somebody came around, one of the Mexican cowboys came around. And he was on his horse, see what was going on. And they kept egging me on to get on the horse. And I didn't want to get on a horse. And they said, get on a horse. And they said, well, if you won't get on a horse, give the horse a ride. You know, let the horse get on your back and take him around. <laughs> and so finally, I got up on the horse. Nobody there knew that I used to own a horse. I used to have a ride Mexican style. Oh, yeah. And yeah, I, I did. So I took him down half the, uh, the other half of the arena. And I flanked him, I kicked him. And so he took off like a bat out of hell. And everybody's looking, I'm running, going right for the crowd. And all of a sudden they start panicking at the last minute. I reined the horse up and he skidded on his on the heels, just like I knew he would. And wow. at the top of my lungs, I started singing a Mexican song. <laughs> and everybody just started laughing. Wow. So that's about the only thing. This, this, uh, Mr. Tiller Russell, just like I said, beyond my wildest expectations. It was a great documentary. My wife, who we interviewed, uh, my wife didn't want to be a part of it. She's an introvert. She's shy and quiet. Mm. And I told her, I, I can't force you into doing this. You know, I'm asking you if you would, because I think it would really have an impact on wives of other cops. Yeah. And let the public see what the other side's really like. Mm. What is it really like to be the wife of a cop or what it's like for the personal life of cop families? And uh, so she did. And I'm very fortunate. Uh, everything came out well. And Mr. Tiller Russell, I can't say enough about it. When he called me up, I told him, he said, well, this is my idea. This is what I want to do. And I said, stop. I don't want to know what you want to do with the documentary. You're the professional, I'm not. Yeah. I'm just your talking head. And 
He said, well, we'll show you along. I said, I don't need to see rough cuts. I don't need to see anything. When it drops, I'll watch it like everybody else. And so he called me up the night it was going to drop. And he said, okay, it's dropping tonight. And he said, enjoy the ride. I said, what do you mean? He said, just enjoy the ride. I'll talk in a few weeks. And I hung up and I cried watching it. And I laughed. And the first thing I did when it was over is I asked my wife for forgiveness yeah. because I didn't realize how frightened she was and I wasn't there for her. Uh, then I just started getting replies from all around the world. And it trended number one in Netflix here in the U.S. for a week and a half and mm -hmm. six in the world. And the ride, I've spoken all over the U.S. Um, still get calls to speak all over the U.S. Uh, I've done television spots for Australia and for Canada. Yo, just one last question. Ramirez, was he physically an imposing figure? Was he, um, was, he a bi was he a big guy, a lanky guy? What was he? The only, thing I, the only thing I remember about Richard was he had hands for days. He had great big hands. That he did have. Yeah. And he had a very, very thin waist. And that proverbial V. Very yeah. skinny waist, big hands. Uh, other than that, he, he didn't seem any different to me. He was just okay. Oh, you know, I, well, I think okay. I think with my size, I could have whipped him. <laughs> well, he got he got whipped by that one community. I mean, that's how he got it. That's basically how they caught him. The whole community was pretty much a manhunt, and uh, they yeah. think they beat the shit out of him. He, he tried Jack and car jack in a, a car the lady screamed her husband came out hit him in the head with a pipe and the neighbors heard the commotion they started now he had been given he had been running probably for about a three mile sprint jumping yeah. over walls across the across the freeway you know and that's eight lane at that time it was eight or ten lanes of traffic yeah you know, and he made it across all over fences he's tired mm. so they got him, they knocked him down, and then they didn't have to beat him anymore. He gave up. You know, here I am. And yeah. really, the citizens at that time were good people mm. and really didn't know who, who it was. His picture had been released the night before. Yes. Initially, they didn't really know who it was. And had it been, because it was in a rough part of town, had it been the gang members in that area, they'd have killed him just because. Yeah. You know, he wasn't from their area, and he's messing with their people. They'd have killed him. Mm. But they didn't. Well, Gil, listen, uh, I know you praised for time. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, all the best for for everything else you've got going on. And um, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was my pleasure. And to all your viewers, God bless you all. Enjoy life. Thank you so much.